how do you decide what to invest in? How do you examine the opportunity costs of that investment? And how do you make sure you're giving your investments every chance to succeed? That's what we've been talking about this month. But what happens when the investment that you're considering seems like a pretty straightforward payoff, but taking advantage of that opportunity might conflict with your values? How do you balance the financial health of your business against those values? Because those values should be an important consideration of any investment you're making. But we all still need to actually make money in order for our businesses to survive. I'm Susan Bowles, and you're listening to Break the Ceiling, the show where we break down unconventional strategies you can use to save time, boost your profit, and increase your operational capacity. A great example of this balance of investments and values came earlier this summer with the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. Now, if you're not familiar with the campaign, it's a joint collaboration between the Anti-Defamation League, Color of Change, Sleeping Giants, the NAACP, Free Press, and Common Sense. And they launched an advertising boycott against Facebook to protest their decisions to consistently allow blatant voter suppression, hate speech, election tampering, and more on their platform. So these organizations wanted to hit Facebook where it hurts, their profits, by pulling advertising dollars from the platform. Lots of high profile brands have joined the campaign, including Coca-Cola, The North Face, Ben & Jerry's, REI, Patagonia, Hershey's, and more. Now, whether or not the campaign will ultimately be effective is yet to be seen. But it's a great example of companies choosing their values over the relatively easy payoff of investing in advertising dollars. Now, while this is a great example of big businesses choosing values over sales, they generally have bigger budgets, bigger margins, and the risk isn't as personal as it is for small businesses. When it comes to small business, the decision over whether or not to pull advertising or presence from Facebook in protest is certainly much more personal and potentially riskier. For small business owners, you might be talking about risking your mortgage payment, your insurance premiums, or maybe even your groceries. Social media participation and advertising is one of the very few channels that's readily accessible to small businesses. The payoff for running Facebook or Instagram ads is usually pretty high if you're doing it right. And that might be one of the main channels through which you bring in new clients, which contributes to your revenue and your financial health. It seems like for most small businesses, running Facebook or Instagram ads should be a no brainer. But what about when you disagree with the decisions the platform makes or what they stand for? Is it worth potentially risking your business to stand up for your beliefs? Now, as the Stop Hate for Profit campaign was heating up this summer, this became a topic of discussion in a lot of the online business communities I was a part of. Business owners were wondering, should I pull my ads? Pull my presence off the platform completely? You know, they supported the concept of the campaign, but could they really afford to risk their business by leaving the platform? And if they did, what would that look like? So. Today, I want to explore that decision-making process and see what it looks like for two business owners. We're going to explore their thought process and how they approached the decision to stay or to go. Now, I want to preface this episode with a note that I don't think there's one right answer here. And my goal isn't actually to convince you to go one way or another, but to think critically about what's the right decision for you and for your business. Ultimately, I want you to think about how your values could play into your decisions about what to invest in. First up, meet Nancy Jane Smith. Nancy is a licensed professional counselor with 13 years in private practice, and she spent 20 plus years working as a counselor and a coach for people with high functioning anxiety. She's written three books on living happier, and she's the host of the Live Happier podcast. Now, ultimately, Nancy decided to pull off Facebook and Instagram altogether back in July. And we're going to talk through why she made that decision, what came up for her while she was thinking through what to do, and we'll talk about what's happened in her business since she left. Hey, Nancy, thanks for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah, me too. This is um, kind of constantly playing out in my head. So I am really excited to talk to you about this. So social media is kind of one of those investments that we make in our business that 
might have a good payoff, maybe. Uh, but it also comes with a lot of requirements. There's a big time investment. Maybe there's money that you need to invest. Maybe you need to hire somebody to manage it. Uh, so when you were considering your move away from social media, what came up for you? <laughs> well, it, you know, when I first started considering it, it was really... I had swallowed the lie completely that I had to have social media, that that was the only way to do it, um, that I had to post regularly and um, and share all the things. I had even just invested money in, in having a designer, you know, brand my Instagram stuff. So it was all ready to go and, and perfect. And so when I started debating it, and I, could, I don't even remember, I think I was having a conversation with a friend and she said, you know, maybe we, maybe we don't need social media. And I was like, like mind blown, like, no way, that is impossible. Um, and then the more it really became, the driving force uh, that really spurred the decision was my feelings about Zuckerberg and how he manages Facebook and and unfortunately, Instagram, because I, you know, Facebook was easy to leave. Instagram is was a little bit more challenging for me. Um, but I, but I knew if I was going to make the decision, I had to leave both because my my main reason for wanting to leave my main, the the, it was just recognizing if I'm going to build a business based on my values and and the values of Facebook and Instagram are so counter to my own values, why am I continuing to um, feed into this giant monster of of a thing? So that was really the the first thing that I considered. And then it was, oh my gosh, you're not going to have, how, how are you going to sell stuff? Like no one's going to be able to see you. This is where you go. And I realized that I was, that I would do a lot of spinning all day long on social media. I'd spin on Facebook. I'd spin on Instagram. I would waste time. And then I would write a post and be like, I did something for my business today. I wrote a post on freaking social media. Like, <laughs> like I wasn't engaging in my business. I was just kind of in this rote pattern of do a podcast, post it on Facebook, write a post, post it on Instagram. And I wasn't really engaging in my business. And so that was factor number two that was a rec recognition to me of how much um, I needed to, that maybe I needed to look at this differently. So walk me through kind of the decision process you went through as you decided to leave. What, what factored into this overall decision and how did you actually make the decision to say, yep, I'm going to leave, I'm going to do it, and then pull the plug? So the, all this happened for me right around the time, the timing of the George Floyd um, I was debating it before that, but then when the, the, the George Floyd Black Lives Matter movement started happening and it was a, a wake up call to me of how performative social media is. And all these people were posting things about Black Lives Matter. And, you know, that that was at the time when we everyone did the blackout. Um, mm -hmm. And I was that really got me thinking and really got me questioning like how much of this is is helping me and how much am I just doing it because someone somewhere has told me this is important and it was the first time in a long time that I really started taking my business seriously I started questioning my business and questioning where my values were fitting into the business and so that was kind of the beginning of debating it I was talking about it with a friend I was I was going on forums that I belong to and and sharing you know my my debating about this and then I listened to Jenny Blake did a podcast and I think it was a couple years ago um, that it came out and she talked about how she did not have she didn't do social media at all and had totally gotten off of social media. And she's a, you know, a, she's written a number of, of books. She does a lot of speaking. And that she, that that gave me hope. Here's someone who is building a business successfully, who is not on social media. And that was the first example of someone that I saw that could, that, that could be possible. And so, so then I was like, okay, I got to get some things in place here to... To, to do this one of the to make this transition and because it, it social media is so passive that was the biggest thing mm -hmm. it, it's a passive way of, of engaging with people and I was doing all the things I mean I was posting regularly I had the branded posts I had tons of posts but I didn't have a lot of followers you know I mean I think I hit a thousand followers and I would post something up and I might get 20 likes or 30 likes and I might get some engagement and it, it, but it wasn't like 
anything was going viral or, you know, I was getting all these followers, it just, it would, it was just trickling in. And so I really started questioning how much of this am I doing to perform for other people and how much of this am I doing for me? The second factor is I work with people who have anxiety. That's my business model is helping women with high functioning anxiety and nothing. The one thing that triggers my anxiety more than anything is getting on freaking social media. So here getting on social media and doing the scroll allowed me to um, get stuck in comparison syndrome. It, it allowed me to think I was doing something when I wasn't. It was just this constant passiveness. And so one of the things someone suggested was um, we were, they were talking about SEO. And I have not done anything with SEO like that, you know, getting people to my website through SEO was just was never it felt like a gimmick to me. It just wasn't something that I invested in. And so I actually talked to an SEO um, person. I think it's the same person that you might be working that you're working with, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and she was like, oh, my gosh, you have this amazing website that has all this content on it, but no one can find it because your SEO sucks. Like, and so I, she's like, once we can do these few switches, we can, we can get people to your website and not direct them just from social media. So that felt like, okay, now I have a plan. I'm doing, it's, it's not just that I'm dropping social media, I'm dropping social media, but I'm adding this new way for people to find me that is in my niche, um, and fine tuned. And so that felt good. Like I was adding something else and I've been blogging since 2008. So mm. there was a ton of content on my website that no one was accessing. And then I was just creating more content on Instagram and no one was accessing it, you know, like it wasn't <laughs> going anywhere. So, um, so then I decided I had to hit, I had to just pull the plug. Like I was going to debate it forever and t unless I set a date. And so a, a friend of mine and I both, she, I set the date hard. I said, I'm going to go July 1st, all in, I'm dumping it all in on July 1st. And the irony was that right before July 1st, a podcast, I was on, a, I was on a podcast and it was, it was really popular. I didn't realize that it was so popular when I recorded it. And I got a ton of Instagram followers. I mean, I think I increased uh... up, like, I think I got like 350 Instagram followers in a couple oh, wow. days. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, maybe this is a sign. I shouldn't be leaving. Like I get all, I'm, I have all these followers. So, um, but I stuck with it. I said, nope, I'm getting off of it July 1st. And the, the two things that really pushed me over that finish line was one, the, the politics of Zuckerberg and two, my own values of that I'm, if my goal is to help people with, with anxiety, I should not be directing them to a place that causes anxiety, which is social media. And so really pushing my uh, clients and my listeners and my followers, for lack of a better term, um, and putting them in the forefront and recognizing I need they need to get off of this platform. And I don't want to be the ones the one that's encouraging them to go on it. Mm. So when you decided to leave, was it just Facebook and Instagram or have you, were you not active on other platforms or have you left all social media altogether? Well, I left, so I left, so I left Facebook. So I deactivated my account on Facebook. I, if initially I was like, I'm going to delete everything and I'm going to be really, you know, like I'm going off. And then I, at the last second I was like, ah, oh, we're just going to deactivate. <laughs> So I deactivated Facebook and I, and I did keep my Instagram. So my Instagram profile is still there um, because I was getting all the um, new followers. I just put a link where they can sign up for my newsletter list. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I just decided that would be, and so I'm going to revisit that in, um, I set a date for September 1st to revisit how many, if I'm getting a lot of new followers, then I'll keep that there. If I'm not, I'll, I'll pull that as well. Uh, because I just didn't want to lose all those people. But, and I will say my Instagram or my, uh, email list has increased like that's. Mm, so you actually did manage to 
drive people who found you on Instagram to your email list. Yes. And so my email list last year, I bet it grew by maybe 50 people last year. Like it was so barely moved at all. And this year I have added, I think, 400 people. Um, most of that coming from podcast interviews I've done and um, and people sharing my stuff. Very few of that and, you know, maybe coming from Instagram, but I wasn't getting a ton since leaving Instagram. I've gotten more followers than when I was on it, if that makes <laughs> sense. Uh, more people on my newsletter list than when I was on it. So I so I got off and I then the other thing that's interesting is I built a dummy account on Instagram because I, I, have, I have all these cats and dogs that I enjoy following on Instagram that just make me happy and bring me joy. And so I was like, maybe I can do this dummy account and still follow the handful of cats and dogs that I follow to see what's happening with them. And but and I made up a new email. I did all the things to keep it anonymous, but I put my phone number in my and wouldn't you know, Bamo Instagram suggesting that I follow all these coaches and all these, yeah. you know, it found me. And so that just freaked me out and I was like I'm done. Like I can't, like I'm I can't even do the dummy account and I could go on YouTube and follow, you know, those those cat dog people are everywhere. Um, but I am. And so then immediately after I got off of Facebook and Instagram, I got on Twitter. And that was for a while was where I was scrolling, Twitter scrolling, uh, just kind of the habit of scrolling and yeah. and getting input from other people and seeing what other people are doing. And so Twitter and LinkedIn are two things where I'm you know, I haven't gotten off of them yet. I'm debating doing more with LinkedIn in general, like mm -hmm. like building more of a platform there. I haven't done anything with that yet. But the um, I ended up unfollowing a lot of people on Twitter and making it way more boring. And so I don't hop on that. Um, I'm, I'm not doing the scrolling as much as I was. I will say what I miss about it is is getting that input, getting other ideas. Um, mm coming from other places and and linkedin provides some of that um i haven't really you know I, I don't know much about linkedin and i haven't spent a lot of time on there but that's something i am i have to go search out so i subscribe to a lot more newsletter lists than i used to um just getting people's links and seeing and engaging in those different conversations interesting because i that was one of my kind of follow-up questions is that so you know it's been about a month or two since you left um and wanting to know you know what have you noticed happening after leaving and at least for me the the reason that i'm finding it hard to pull the plug on instagram is that that is the primary social media channel for most of my business friends mm -hmm. um is that's where i find out what they're doing and we send each other dms and um so for me it's less of a like promotion channel because i just don't really use it that way but yeah. um that's where my friends hang out so um what you know what have you noticed since leaving has either positive or negative i've noticed a lot more um so the negative is that what i said about the the lack of input and just um mm -hmm. not getting as much articles uh, but one thing i have noticed that i didn't really think would happen uh, you know i didn't think would be a positive is the i'm so much more intentional now of I like I will in the past, like if there was a podcast that I listened to that I that I liked, I would have just thrown it up on on Instagram or thrown it up on social on Facebook and suggested people listen to it. Now I'll text people and say mm. it, that I individually think of like, hey, you would really like this or check this out or I'll email them. So in that way, it's really helped some of my relationships that I reach out individually more and where I would have just done a blanket post. And so that whole and I've I use Voxer a lot in how I work with clients. And so that's something I've started using with people in my life is just using Voxer instead of social media, instead of that direct message way, I'll just hop on Voxer with them and leave a message that I would have left on instant or direct messaging. So that is something that's been really cool. I've also had a lot more creativity because I'll come up with an idea. It used to be I would come up with an idea and I'll be like, oh, that would make a great social media post. And I'd hop on you know, Instagram, and I'd make it into a social media post. And that would be the end of the thought. Like I, 
wouldn't think anything more of it. Now I have a thought, I write it down, and then I expand it. So it becomes a newsletter post, or it becomes mm. a podcast episode. So things are, I can, I'm going deeper with stuff than just posting it up and, and forgetting about it, uh, like I would before. And so my, my newsletter has gotten stronger because of, of that, because now I, this is the one way it's I'm talking focused. to people. Yeah. Is, is through my newsletter. So that has even been better. Um, and I would say I have so much more headspace. I, the amount of time that I would fake work <laughs> <laughs> because I was scrolling on Instagram or, or social media, or I would, you know, like I would think of an idea for my business and then I'd be like, oh, well, let's go see what people are doing about this. If anyone else is doing this. And then I'd hop on social media and go down the rabbit hole, seeing if anyone else was doing it. And, you know, in the name of research, but it was way off the beaten path yeah. of research. I, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I would, you know, I'd do that for a couple hours, more than I care to admit. And I would be, or it would be a way I would procrastinate on writing a podcast episode. Instead of writing a podcast episode, I'd be researching on, on social media. And no, so we don't, we don't do that. I, yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I feel very attacked right now. <laughs> Because I, part of me is like, as I'm saying it, I'm like, I hope other people are going to agree with this. And I'm not the only one out there that's wasted uh, hours. I 100% do that all the time. <laughs> and so that was a commitment I made um, when I got off was that if I was hitting a, a spot where I didn't want to keep working, where I was procrastinating, or I was just, you know, in the scroll mode, I get up and I leave my office and I go mm. do something else. And then I come back and I and I finish or I buckle down and say, we got to we got to finish this it's because and that has dramatically decreased my work day because I don't have all this filler time anymore. You're just you're showing up, you're doing the work you're supposed to do and then you're done. Yes, exactly. And there's no like, should I should I be posting? Should I have my posting? Should I interact with people? Should mm -hmm. I be networking? What should I be doing? Um, and kind of that like just really dizzy headspace where you're not quite sure what to do next um, but you feel like you should be doing something and that's uh, I completely relate to that because that's exactly how I feel about social media yeah it's <laughs> and it, for the longest time you know at the beginning of my business I consciously did not do social media because I just didn't have time for it and I wasn't sure that it huh. was going to be effective and um, I definitely notice since I um, since I quit my full-time job and I'm doing work full time when I'm in Scalespark full time now, uh, I totally fill that up. Like it's, it's so much harder now to be really clear about what's work and what's not, mm -hmm. um, and what's important and what's not. And having to like reestablish those boundaries, um, has been really interesting watching myself ignore doing that. <laughs> it's right. Really, it's, it's probably the most accurate way of putting that is that I'm aware that I need to put a boundary and then just not doing it. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Because that was the other thing for me. I know, you know, people said like, oh, well, just unfollow people that, you know, trigger you or just, you know, have someone else do your social media and, and don't get on it. And, and all that just felt like a, a band aid on a gaping wound. Like it mm -hmm. wasn't enough for where I was and my relationship with social media. And, and it was kind of hijacking my business because I wasn't fully engaged in my business because I was social media just had it, it. I feel like it had its hooks in me. And so yes. I was constantly looking outside of myself for where I need to go next, what needs to happen next. And now I can just be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And, um, and I have to be more creative. So I've, I've pitched myself to more podcasts. I have, you know, I'm, like I said, I've gotten more intentional about my newsletter, like all of these ways that we, that I had ditched because social media was, oh, you know, it was, was just taking up all of your time. Yeah. It was so superior to me in how to do it. And, and I didn't really realize until I posted it on, um, you know, the, what works forum that we're both members of until I posted it on that and then got the reaction of, Oh, wow. Wow. You're cool. Oh, oh, she's going off social media. Like, <laughs> like you would have thought I was saying, I'm going to give it all up and go live with the monks. It was just so <laughs> countercultural. And I didn't feel it was that countercultural. By the time I brought it to the group, I was already pretty far down in the decision-making process. 
Yeah, that. and you you are definitely further ahead of me on the decision making process than I am because I'm still definitely in the is I, I'm 100% committed to not having Facebook, but I've really never had face. I mean, my I have a page, but I don't I haven't posted on it mm -hmm. hardly ever, other than like automated posts from the podcast. Um, Instagram, like you, I have a lot harder time trying to figure out. Um, is it a necessary discovery platform? Is it something where my people actually are? Is it something that is going to bring me a return on investment? Or are there ways that I could get a better return on the investment of my time as it relates to getting new clients? Is, is it necessary or is there a better way? Um, and so I am loving watching your journey of, <laughs> You're like testing my hypothesis for me of what happens if you, what happens if you just bail? Um, and let me ask you, as you are pitching other podcasts and doing other promotion strategies, I know for a lot of bigger podcast guests, they are, they, and I mean, you know, for the show too, when you are a guest on someone's podcast part of that like mm -hmm. social contract is that you are going to share it through to your audience um and i mean that's really why i ended up on instagram to begin with is just mm -hmm. that most of the podcast guests that's their primary channel it was never a channel for me i've never committed to it <laughs> other than i post there for a podcast um have you had any pushback from that or you know you sharing it on your email newsletter is plenty or how how have you kind of approached that i guess it's a social contract is maybe the best way to yeah. to kind of describe that relationship it's kind of expected mm -hmm. um how do you because that was you approach that that really was a um that has not been a big deal at all it was a big, it was a, it was a, a factor for me, like, oh, people are going to be upset that I can't, you know, that I'm not going to post on Instagram. But then it was really for me, and I have this whole thing written, like to send to people if it becomes a thing to say, I have my news, I never shared podcasts on my newsletter. Like when I, before, I would just post it on an Instagram story and that would be the end of it. And, you know, and maybe 50 people saw it on Instagram story and, a third of those were friends, you know, or family. Like mm. they weren't even people that were, this was going to be pertinent to them. Now, if I'm on a podcast, I share it in my newsletter. And so, which is, that's eyes, you know, that is, the people are clicking on. Like, I right. think. That's a lot more engagement than randomly like, oh, yes. it was so much fun to be on this podcast. Here yes. it is. Yeah. Versus here's a podcast I was on and this is why and this is why you need to listen to it. So I think there is but that I what I recognized in myself is how many of those social contracts and I say that in quotes, there were that that aren't really beneficial They're to the really other there. person. Yeah, you know, it, I don't, I didn't have a huge Instagram following. It wasn't like it was 10,000 people that were seeing it. Um, because so I had this smaller following anyway, and then stories makes it even smaller. And so versus putting it on my newsletter and and having it on my website is a d very different. They're getting more people than they were before. Right. Interesting. Um, so is there anything else you think we should talk about that we haven't touched on yet? Anything that was um, either important for you or that you think we should just... Mention? Well, I just, I did want to, because I think those social contract things get, played a bigger role for me than I recognized and why I couldn't go off. And, and even someone said to me, so two things I want to say about that. One was since, and like I said, I got all this influx of followers um, right after I went off because of the podcast I was on. And I noticed that they weren't, the number of followers I got did not equal the number of new people to the newsletter. You know, like mm. they weren't going to the my page and reading my bio to see that I'm no longer on Instagram, go here instead. And even my last post is my podcast episode explaining why I'm getting off of social media. And every when I go back to check it like once a week I'll hop on just to see what's happening on my page and I'll have like you know 10 new likes on that podcast episode okay but the podcast episode is saying I'm not here anymore <laughs> you know <laughs> like you don't need to you don't need to like you don't this. need to recognize this I'm not <laughs> I'm not I'm not here I'm not to get here. your feedback <laughs> 
And I'm also, and then they'll follow me. Well, they're just following me blindly. They're not going to the page and reading about me. They're just blindly following me. And, right. and that, so I think that's another one of those, like starting to pay attention to how many of these messages we've received are built in, you know, like that we take as you can't leave social media um, and start questioning them. And they all start falling apart. Another one, another one of those was someone said to me, oh, well, I think it's very uh, privileged of you to say you can get off of social media and, and build a slow, you know, build a slower business because some people really need to be doing this quicker. And, and my comment was, we've built businesses for years, not on social media. Like, since when yeah. did social media become the only way to build a business and the only method to reach people? And I have done all the things except for buy a lot of ads. That's the only thing I didn't do. And that is, you know, if I was buying all the ads, that would be privilege, in my opinion. Like, I'm just pouring money into ads and I'm getting this huge following there is privilege because not everyone can do that. But I was trying to do it organically because I didn't want to give them any more of my money. I was trying to do it organically from the get go and it wasn't working. So that's another one of those, you know, thing. There are a lot of things that people throw up as to resistance as to why you should you shouldn't get off social media and and really questioning those has brought me a new love of my business. It has re-energized my business mm. to be like, this is my business and I can do it however I want to do it. And if I want to do this experiment and see what happens, let's do it. And, and, and as of right now, a month in, it has been nothing but great things. Like, and I don't even know what I'm missing on social media. Like that's the beauty yeah, of it. You I get it. As far as I can tell, nothing. <laughs> As somebody who's been scrolling for the last month, um, you haven't missed anything. <laughs> and I have a huge, uh, and I was really active on Facebook, Facebook, like um, my personal page of Facebook. Like oh, I really? was very active with friends and family. And, um, and so, and that has been a huge weight lifted off of me not to have to engage and like and th that I agree with so I stopped like engaging on my my page exists I'm still there um but I haven't engaged in anything on Facebook probably for a year and a half or so um, and you're right as soon as I stopped opening Facebook and just stopped like I turned off my notifications and I turned off and I was just like doesn't exist anymore um it was so freeing mm -hmm. it was so like it's it's one of those platform platforms where for me there's just so much and there's so many emotional triggers that come from oh, yes. Facebook mm -hmm. that don't happen to me necessarily on my other platforms because yeah. my other platforms are all business mm -hmm. people uh, I don't have a lot of like personal connections on any of the other platforms it's all on Facebook and um yeah Facebook leaving Facebook even though I technically have not left right <laughs> um, I'm not on it either <laughs> i'm like in the gray area where i haven't really pulled the trigger to delete it um but also haven't like it doesn't exist for me as a social media platform anymore mm -hmm. um, yeah. the last like i was only there because i had a group that i was um i wanted to be active and i wanted to participate in mm -hmm. and they were hosted on facebook and gradually i realized i just stopped engaging with the group because it was so painful to just go on to like just even open the app yes um, yeah that i just stopped luckily they have just now left facebook and i'm so thrilled because i'm like oh i can i can be engaged mm -hmm. in this again this is great yeah yeah because it is amazing how it makes you so self like it makes me really self-centered to be like mm -hmm. oh i gotta like this person's because they're gonna be mad at me if i don't like them really are they even noticing they don't know? notice they don't notice <laughs> but I, all of that mental gymnastics yes. would would take up headspace that is now gone and and i would have that same thing on instagram of oh this person they're gonna see that i'm seeing their story and they're gonna wonder why i didn't comment or just like i'm not the center of the universe here people it, people aren't tracking me all the time but somewhere <laughs> in my I head mean, they are I, tracking <laughs> that's well, a thing exactly because <laughs> when i put my phone number in they found me and oh, said I hate that. so the, facebook texted me the other day and i was like are you oh, are you trying to get me to delete my account because i feel like that's what's happening here you're really like 
you were not happy with the gray space of me existing but not participating <laughs> and now you're trying to get me to just pull the plug um and that felt so creepy yeah that is that they're like hey you have a friend request i'm like oh wait a second i didn't this is not what i signed up for exactly. uh -uh, don't text me <laughs> uh all right so where can our listeners find you if they want to connect and learn more because i know it's not instagram or facebook right exactly <laughs> yes that's the other big thing is changing all of that around on like on my podcast and removing all the references um they can find me at my website which is live-happier.com and awesome. they can find me at my podcast is called the happier approach and you have a fabulous episode that we will link to that you did talking about all of this yes. mm -hmm. um, when you decided to leave. That is a fabulous episode. Um, so thank you so much for being here. This was really fun. You're welcome. <laughs> for Nancy, the right call was just leaving altogether. The decision to leave was in sync with her personal values and her desire not to support Facebook as a company. But that decision also came from a place of health, not just hers, but her client's health too. She looked at who her clients were, what they struggled with, and she assessed the potential financial risks to her business and decided it was probably possible to leave the platform with pretty minimal impacts to the overall financial health of her business. Is it worth it? Every small business owner wants to know that the money they spend on their businesses is worth it, that their investments produce results and help them grow. But if you don't know your business finances in and out, it's hard to know whether those expenses and investments are really worth it. Plenty of business owners, even the successful ones, feel like they're shooting in the dark when it comes to how they spend, save, and invest their money. Like you, they wonder if the ads they're buying, the software they're investing in, or the people they're paying are really paying off. And that's stressful. Feeling unsure about how you're spending or investing your money might be common, but it sure isn't fun. I want something different for you. I want you to feel confident that every decision you make is guided by your financial intel. I want you to be able to decide what actions to take to grow your business from a place of confidence and purpose, not panic, so that you can feel masterful at managing your money instead of inept or just plain scared. I want you to know exactly what's working so you can go all in and make your money make more money. This is what I do for business owners when I step in as their chief financial officer on demand. I help them parse the numbers, look for opportunities, and invest where it counts. We get clear on where they're getting in their own way and where the math just doesn't add up. And now I want to teach you to do the same for your own business, because trust me, you can. Join me for Think Like a CFO. It's a four month accelerator, online workshop and small group coaching program where I'll work alongside you so you can start thinking like a CFO and know that every penny you spend on your business is worth it. You'll dig into your relationship to money, put your financial data at your fingertips and build systems of cash flow, taxes and budgeting. I'll help you integrate your financial knowledge into your operational systems and technology so that your whole business works better. And by the end, you'll feel wildly capable with your money. Think Like a CFO is starting soon. So go to scalespark.co slash CFO to get all the information and sign up. I can't wait to work with you. My next guest is Bonnie Gillespie. Bonnie works with actors and creatives. As a weekly columnist, she began demystifying the casting process for actors back in 1999. Her most popular book is Self-Management for Actors, the curriculum upon which her teaching is based. And as a producer and Emmy-honored casting director, Bonnie specializes in indie darlings, whether casting, coaching, or exploring the woo as the astrologer's daughter, she's passionate about leaving this world better than she found it. And Bonnie's perspective on Facebook is pretty different from Nancy's. She still disagrees with Zuckerberg and with Facebook's platform in general, but she decided to use the platform to increase the amount of good she can do in the world. For her, Facebook and Instagram are tools she can use to find exactly the right people that she can help. And since those people are on the platforms, she needs to be there too.
Hey, Bonnie, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, Susan, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So can you describe how you are using Facebook and Instagram in your business right now? We currently have a fabulous ads person who puts us up through Facebook and Instagram with um, with very well-targeted ads for our flagship program. Um, we're growing in our business and have a couple other uh, areas that we're about to move into. And we're taking what we've learned in working with her for the past few months um, about advertising and growth. And we're going to start applying that to other areas in our business, which I'm very excited about because I'm able to then see where you can track spikes in our profits and in our revenue uh, alongside investment in ads at Facebook and Instagram. So uh, we, we are active advertising right now. We did not advertise at all in our business until October, November of 2019. So I'm new to advertising, but we, we went in knowing we had money to spend and we're going to be devoted to it for enough of a period of time to really know if it works before we started changing things. And I think we've, we've really figured out what works for our audience, which has me very excited. Yeah. So how, how long did you guys decide when you were starting? How long did you decide you needed to invest to be able to tell if it was going to work for you or not? What, what was your timeline? To a quarter. A quarter. I, I, yeah. I said, I want to go all in on ads for uh, quarter four, 2019. I want, I know we're going to spend five figures. I, you know, like I'm, I'm so okay with this being, you know, 10, 12, $14,000. Um, I don't want to go much higher than that because, you know, I don't want to just burn through money if something's not working, but I know that the ads get smarter the longer they run. And it's kind of like a Furby. If anybody remembers a Furby from the nineties uh, or the early two thousands, where there was this creature that got smarter, the more you talked to it and it would learn the language. Uh, it's a little bit like that, that the more the advertising is happening, the the pixel gets smarter, the tracking gets clearer, the data gets more uh, refined. And that really helps with finding the right people. We can track where someone comes in and we're able to see that they come, come in through an ad, previously did not know we exist, and they take the steps through our funnel that we hope that they will, and then at the end of that process, spend the money to join our flagship program. And then they are in the program loving it, and they are having an amazing time, and it is giving them all the benefits that we know are possible. And that ride and being able to track it is something that is so thrilling because it shows us that this actually does work when we get uh, the pixel smarter and the ad smarter. Mm. What kinds of results have you been seeing in your business based on the way that you've decided to use ads and Facebook and very definitely an increase in mailing list members. Every time we have an active ad out in the world, and when I say ad singular, I actually mean somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 15 different ads that are testing out different copy and different, um, uh, different images and different audiences, and they're all tweaked in certain ways that are, are just constantly testing, testing, testing. Um, I always see an increase in mailing list numbers. Like we're just, we're only advertising free things. That's all we ever advertise. Free stuff, free stuff, free stuff. So we're just getting your email address. And then once you're in, it's on us to be able to communicate with you in a way that hopefully will lead to sales at some point. But I, because we've never advertised until 2019, I am used to a very long nurturing process before someone actually purchases something, if ever. Uh, like there are some people who will be with me for a decade before they actually spend any kind of money. And what Facebook ads and Instagram ads have allowed us to do is shorten that process, that timeline by quite a bit. Um, but I always see an increase in uh, mailing list numbers, and I see an increase in social media follow following, and I see an increase in members of our Facebook group, um, which has gone to like 13,000, almost 14,000 members, and we vet every member. So it's not that we just open, accept everyone, um, and we regularly remove people who are not a right fit for it. And so the, the numbers have increased quite a bit uh, with the right kind of the right kind of person, which we're really excited about. Mm. 
So talk to me a little bit just generally about how you feel about Facebook, Instagram, either as a platform or as a company as it relates to you or your business. Well, I'm always... I don't want to say cautious because I know Zuckerberg is always listening. Uh, so I, <laughs> I'm mindful, not cautious, but I'm always mindful that when I say Mark Zuckerberg is the devil, that he's listening and is <laughs> keenly aware uh, of my opinion about him and what he has contributed to the downfall of uh, in our society in so many ways. Um, I, I am not an idealist in that I am keenly aware of Mark Zuckerberg's power and influence and where it's been used in some really negative ways. Um, so I personally am not a fan of the platform of Facebook and less and less I am a fan of Instagram. I, I was late to the Instagram party. I didn't, didn't get on Instagram until... I want to say like late 2015, early 2016. So I didn't, I didn't jump on that right away uh, because I was like, I have a Flickr account. Why do I need Instagram? I did not understand that those were different things. Um, but I, I know that there are reasons to use the tools. There, there are ways that they work. Um, and so I am under no illusion of, no, 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 it's great. It's fine. It's not all that bad. I'm like, oh, no, no, it is evil. And I am able to do really good things with that evil platform for now. Um, so yeah, I, I have a friends list account at Facebook, which is something that really interests people because I have such a big following there. My business page has 11,000 followers. The Facebook group itself, as I mentioned, has 13, 14,000 people. Um, but I have no friends. And that is the status of my account since 2010 at Facebook. And I really love that because it means I don't actually go into Facebook as anything other than a business person there to do business. I don't have connections with people that I'm related to or friends with in real life. Um, I don't have a feed. All it is is groups because I admin groups and a member, a member of groups. Um, and it really makes my time in Facebook very specifically focused to the cause, which is grow my business, do more good in the world. And then when we're at a tipping point of the evil of Facebook and Instagram has now outweighed the amount of work that I'm able to do that is good in the world, um, I, I will tap out. Or when my reach has gotten so great that I don't need them anymore, I, I'll tap out. And so it's, I don't even want to call it a necessary evil, but it's very definitely an evil. Uh, so as you are kind of evaluating tools that you could use to market your business, you could use to drive sales, how does your evaluation of using Facebook and Instagram play into that evaluation versus all of the other tools that are out there available for you? Yeah, that's a really good question because we had, had examined absolutely zero advertising prior to deciding to do Facebook ads in 2019. And what I mean by that is our entire business has been grown uh, over you know 20 plus years in word of mouth and uh, great reviews for my book at Amazon or um, you know best kept secret just so many people saying you know oh you got to work with Bonnie Gillespie oh you need to get self-management for actors just the the word out in such a way that we trusted people were coming to us and the right people because it was word of mouth which meant it was always being mentioned along with a, here's what to actually expect. So it kept bringing us the right people. It just was a slow growth <laughs> investment, the, that whole, that, that's not so much an advertising method, right? Um, but when I look at what other options are out there, I can't see anything that seems as effective in, in the short term as the Facebook and Instagram option. And that's part of why we hired someone who specifically has that as her zone of genius so that we didn't have to learn all the ins and outs and stay up on the algorithm and the changes in the pixel. Like we didn't want to learn that. We wanted to be able to have someone who is a genius about that and who stays on top of all the changes um, and just invest in that person. And honestly, if that person tells us I'm seeing less effective things happening in in the world of Facebook and Instagram, we would defer to her and where she believes we might be better off uh, in spending our resources for advertising um, rather than me kind of investigating for myself what all the options are. Hmm. 
So in the discussion that we were having uh, prior to this discussion now, you talked about having a mindset of being in the place where you can do the most good. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So our ideal buyer, our, our perfect person, the one who's going to come into the self-management for actors world, thrilled to learn that my book and my methods exist, uh, is on Instagram, uh, is on Twitter, is on Facebook. Uh, they, they are using social media. They're not on LinkedIn because they're they're actors, they're creatives. They they're in the they're in the movie business. They they're not necessarily um, building connections in a corporate world. So um, there are just certain platforms that are a part of our perfect person's world, and they may use those platforms to build their brand as an artist and as a creative and as a content creator. And they too are aware that it's not necessarily the place that they want to be because they love it. In fact, they're aware that it's anxiety producing and, um, and, and some, sometimes downright criminal in terms of what it puts in front of everyone. Um, however, they are aware that that ability to build a fan base is something that serves them. And so when they're able to see in their feed, our, brand and me as someone who can instruct them into the in the mindset and business side of running a creative business and being in show business and all the things that are not taught in a, a conservatory or even getting a master's uh, uh, of art in theater like you're not being taught how to run your business and handle the mindset of being rejected every day and if i can connect with people who have felt that absence in their lives, I'm actually helping them then build their business and stay in the world of creating art that heals, uh, which allows us to, as a, as a group, do more good in the world than Facebook could ever do harm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, love... I, see, I, I just see the role of artists as we, we heal the world with our art. The storytelling is a healing art. And so when we have artists who are called to perform and to uh, tell stories of the voices that are otherwise not amplified and they know what an important platform entertainment can be and they're in it for those reasons not because they want to get famous that's my right person and so it's it's almost like we've both agreed to rendezvous on these platforms that we know we have to use for our businesses, but we also know that there's a greater good that we're able to do and a greater reach that we're able to get by using these as our tools rather than being used by them. Mm, I like that. So I really love your perspective of this being this tool that you can use to bring the right people to you really efficiently to... Um, increase the overall good that you can do with your business up until the point where your future business maybe doesn't need this tool anymore or you have enough reach. Talk to me a little bit about what that might look like or that thought process. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting because there's the part of the brain that goes, well, if not Facebook, then what? Uh, you know, if not Instagram, then what? Like, what's the platform? And so I go, well, let's let's segregate what it is that we're looking to replace and for me, it's if it's a place where, for instance, we have an online community for self-management for actors. We have a, a, mem a flagship membership with hundreds of active members in it co consistently and a very, very active uh, behind the paywall community and space where members are having conversations every day. We're not on Mighty Networks. We're not on Facebook. We are, in fact, a community that is within the curriculum space on our own website, on our own server. Like that's how much we are dedicated to this is our space. I never want to build an empire on somebody else's land. So the, the way that I see the, the whole world of when we're 
when we're at a tipping point for no longer needing a Facebook or an Instagram or even a Twitter or a space that is out there in front of eyeballs that don't know our little word world exists is when there are enough people in that space. And we call it the dojo because it's where we're in there to work out and, and to get more ninja in our tricks. Like how, how can we be more resourceful, more aware of what's going on in the industry? How can we pull back the curtain and really have that transparency of you know fighting the ills that exist and and really staying in it and keeping our mindset healthy for the long haul of a creative career uh, when we have enough people in there that word of mouth is then again the more effective advertising uh, tactic we can close off the free Facebook group the business page, the Instagram space, the, the, even the Twitter account, we, in all of those platforms could go poof at any moment if anybody wanted to shut them down. And so we are already uh, always building toward a world where we can have, um, ha I don't, I don't know what the, what, what the critical mass is for that, but uh, we always say, you know, thousand people in the dojo. Once there's a thousand people in the dojo, that's sort of that thousand true fans uh, concept, uh, and I want to say his name's mm -hmm. Kyle Keller, uh, that came up with that from Wired Magazine a decade plus ago. Uh, and, and having that many people actively working on the process of what we do means the word of mouth then has that amplified uh, effect that social media now doesn't even come close to tackling uh, because that that just has that authentic experience of people saying, no, 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 you have to do this. This is great. This has changed my life. You want to do it too. And I just think that gets bigger over time, which Facebook, of course, helps us contribute to through the ads. Hmm. No, I, I love that perspective as a whole, just that it is a tool that you're using, um, that you're mindful of I guess, mindful and aware of the implications of what's happening on the platform and what's happening with the company behind the platform um, and still making a choice that it it's a conscious choice for you. It's not a, we should be on Facebook because we should be on Facebook. It's we should be on Facebook because that is where our people are. That is where we can get the most visibility. That's where we can do the most good because that's where our people are. Um, I love that it's a conscious choice, but you're still really thinking about um, the implications and thinking about how to eventually transition away from this platform and what what that might look like and when that might look like. Yeah, because I think if we're, I, I, but this is true no matter how big a platform you've created for your own business or one has created for his or her their own business, I, that the there's always got to be that eye toward I am using things out there that I don't own, that I didn't create, that can get taken away. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, if you've got a, a course and you put it on a platform like Kajabi or Teachable or something like that, what happens if the terms of service change and suddenly you, you lose access to your curriculum and all the comments? And, you know, if the, the switch gets flipped and suddenly you're not in control of what happens in that space. I am a terms of service junkie. I love reading the fine print. So I am keenly aware of what rights I'm granting and what I am, uh, what I'm trading for my, my being in a space. And especially in show business, this is one that's really important because something like a site like YouTube, when you upload a video, you're telling YouTube, you have permission to sell this to anyone and you don't have to ask me and you don't have to pay me. And where we saw this play out, uh, gosh, I wanna say a decade ago now, maybe even more like 11, 12 years ago, was someone had a video that they had uploaded to YouTube and they saw it on the opening monologue during one of the late night talk shows. Uh, that it was one of the bits before they went to the interviewing guest portion. And he was like, well, what the hell? Because he, of course, had never given permission. He had never signed anything saying you can you can use this, you know, ABC or whatever, whichever network it was that the show was on. Um, and so he immediately calls his attorney and says, you know, th this was used. I need to get paid for this. And of course, the producers of the show and the network and the parent company all said, take it up with YouTube. 
because YouTube can do that with your footage. And of course, this is a big conversation that we have to have in show business because we have actors and artists and and these brilliant creatives uploading things because they need to be seen and they need to build a fan base. But at the same time, they need to retain the rights to what they've put up so that they can go to like a Sundance Film Festival or sell their their, their, their short that they've created to a network or to a streaming service or to a distribution entity. And just being aware of the, of the fine print is such a part of how I do my business already that I knew getting into bed with Zuckerberg and doing ads would mean that I was saying yes to something akin to big pharma. And I'm like, well, yeah, but if I'm dealing with a disease that is best served with Western medicine and I need to take this prescription in order to get well enough that I no longer need that prescription, I'm going to go on that ride in the short term because in the big picture, it does help. Mm, I love that analogy. Is there anything you think we should talk about that we haven't touched on yet? Um, I want to go back to actually how you started with this with me, which is about the um, investment that we decided upon before we entered the world of, of ads. This is something that I'm so glad I prepared for. And I would love for anyone who's considering advertising for the first time or going back to advertising after a hiatus to consider, see it as an investment that once you're doing it, you're doing it for the long haul. And I mean long haul in the short term <laughs> because uh, <laughs> I, I I know that we're not looking at technology in terms of and forever and forever, amen, we're married to each other, Zuckerberg. And I don't mean like that. What I mean is budget for months, not a single campaign. Like, oh, we have this launch and we know that we have these numbers that we want. We wanna make sure that we get the ads in front of this many people because our conversion rate with this copy is this percentage. And then when we get that percentage of people into our uh, funnel, then we convert this many into buyers. Therefore, this is a, a correct ad spend. I mean, yes, do all that math, work with a guru who knows her stuff, if that's not you, which in this case, it was definitely not me. I mean, I do know a lot of my stuff, this stuff, I knew there's someone better equipped to handle the, all the ins and outs of the ads. Um, but going in, knowing I am not just going to spend for this launch, but I am going to always have something floating out in front of people to keep me top of mind, to keep me in their feed, to keep me relevant. I believe knowing that that is a part of how you get the pixel smarter, you get the ads working better, you get the copy tweaked so that then on your next launch, you just turn up the volume, you, you turn up the reach, you do more of the ads, but you never actually turn them off, you just turn them down to like a maintenance mode. Budgeting for that, I think is what really makes a difference in terms of how effective they can be and how they end up costing you less overall because you end up making them smarter so they're more effective and they're bringing you the right people. They're not bringing you people that you are not a good fit with for the final product. They're not asking for refunds. They're the kinds of people that you're like, gosh, if I could have handpicked the perfect person in a country where I never had a buyer before, this is what she would look like. And then the ad goes and gets her. And then she thanks you for being in her feed because she was just about to lose hope and then saw your ad. And then you were able to bring her into this world where she's now having her eyes wide open to all the opportunity that exists for her because of what you've created and the good that now you together can do in the world. Really having that big picture view uh, even as you're making short-term decisions, I think helps a great deal. And so I would just say, have a budget in mind for a quarter at least, and then even have a, when we're not advertising, what is our advertising budget uh, part of the conversation, which is just enough ads to be out there so that they're not turned off and on. Because that off and on is what makes ads more expensive over time. We think, oh, I'm saving money because I'm not actively launching something right now. It's like, yeah, but you're always brand building. And that brand building is some of the, the best stuff you can be doing for lower pricing on the ads uh, during non-launch periods that allow your launch periods to be way more effective and not crazy expensive. Awesome. So where can our listeners find you if they want to connect or learn more about what you do? 
BonnieGillespie.com is going to be the main hub for all the things. We are in a period of growth right now, so I can't tell you what that place looks like when you get there. It, it is, <laughs> you know, like the web, it's forever changing. Um, but BonnieGillespie.com will be your place for finding out all that I do with actors and creatives in showbiz, as well as my new astrology business. And oh my gosh, the, 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 the options are endless. I work on a lot of enoughness. And what I mean by that is because I work with a generation of people who get rejected every day for a living and can still help them know I am enough at my core, uh, we're taking that enoughness work now out to a, a greater, larger population. And it's really thrilling to me to get to see this at work uh, in a much larger way. Oh, that sounds exciting. It's yummy. I'm having fun. I'm enjoying the growth. And, and the ads are allowing me to grow because I now have this nice, humming in the background thing for what I have already built and I know works and it's allowing me to have leverage to make new decisions and try new things and and explore what my next chapter might be. And I wouldn't have that freedom if I didn't know I have humming in the background, uh, this, this system that's bringing people in. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Bonnie. Thank you for having me, Susan. This is fun. While Nancy and Bonnie didn't choose the same path here, they both do disagree with Facebook's policies. Both consciously evaluated how that value should impact their investment in advertising dollars and in presence on those platforms. They weighed who they worked with, what potential risk there was to their income, and whether or not their business could survive that risk. And they weighed whether or not pulling off the platform would ultimately impact their ability to grow their business. And then they made a decision about their investment accordingly. Both Nancy and Bonnie considered their values as part of that decision to invest in the platform or not. Their evaluation of the investment included their values in the decision-making process, and that's the takeaway here. When you're deciding whether or not to make an investment, considering whether or not that investment is aligned with your values is an important part of that decision-making process, and it's not a piece that you should skip. Next week, we're talking about measuring and evaluating your investments. So once you've made an investment, how do you decide if it really did pay off? Hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you don't miss it. Break the Ceiling is produced by Yellow House Media. Our production coordinator is Sean McMullen. This episode is edited by Marty Seafeld with production assistance by Kristen Runpeck.